There are a lot of programs out there recorded on cassette tapes. Unfortunately, tapes get worn and damaged over time, so it's not always possible to read them back correctly. Today, we're going to dive into what we can do to recover data when a tape fails to load. This is the tape my neighbor gave me, along with this massive TI-99 for a lot. There's such a really funny story there, so if you haven't seen that video, you should go watch it later. Oh uh, my gosh, that's bringing back memories. The important part for today is that I very carefully played back the tape, recorded the data, and it didn't load. It turns out a second program in the same tape loaded just fine, so my process and equipment was working. I think the problem was that the tape was damaged in a section of that program, and we can even see that in Audacity, how the amplitude dips down and pretty much goes away. A lot of you commented in that video saying that the data was definitely recoverable, and all I had to do was increase the volume for that part. And you were right, but it wasn't quite that easy. It turns out that user Mavica on the Discord channel was the first one to get the WAV files I posted, work on them, and was able to recover most of that program. So inspired by that, let's use that as an opportunity to learn about cassette tape recovery and try to get that data back. This is going to be centered around the ti 994 a but most of the techniques should apply to other platforms. Also, before anybody gets really excited, this is not the missing game my neighbor was looking for. This is a typing game called Dogfight, and it's already been archived on the internet. So this is not a unique program, but it will be a good exercise to understand what's going on and how to restore it. So you were right that with some amplification, we may be able to read the signal. For example, the second program looked like this. So it's tempting to just amplify that dip in the middle and hope for the best. I'm actually going to let you in on a little secret. While I was preparing that last video, I did try to boost the amplitude in that section and see if somehow that was enough. And it wasn't. I tried it a couple of times and it didn't work, so I moved on to other things when it was clear that it was going to take a bit more effort than that. Let's actually try that right now, just in case. I'll select that section, boost the amplitude, like so, and then do it in this section again, and okay, that looks reasonably good, right? Yeah, but it fails still, so no surprise there. In order to understand why that failed and what we may need to do to get it to work, let's take a second and understand how data is saved on cassette. Computer data is all digital, so it's a string of zeros and ones. But a cassette tape is intended to record sounds, so we can't just store high and low voltages directly. Instead, the way most computers did it is by using one sound frequency to represent a zero and a different frequency to represent a one. This is called frequency modulation encoding. And that's actually very similar to what a modem would do, which explains that very familiar sound for those of us who use computers with phone lines. The ti 994 a in particular achieved this by toggling the sound output at certain frequencies. The main clock signal to the TMS-9901 is 3 MHz divided by 64, or about 47 kHz. For cassette operations, the clock divider is set to 17, so that becomes 2.76 kHz. And with that set up, to write a 1 to the tape, the computer would toggle its output every clock cycle, creating a sound of about 1379 Hz, and to write a 0, it would toggle it every 2 cycles, creating a resultant sound of 690 Hz. So with that in mind, let's go back and look at the sound file I recorded from the faulty cassette tape. So first of all, this thing at the end was just a different program that was saved earlier, and then this other one was written on top. You can tell the bias is different, and even just listening to it, it's clear that it's something else because it just sounds different. So I'm just going to get rid of that one. Let's zoom in in a healthy area of the file. And let's zoom in some more. And finally, at this level, we can see individual zeros and ones. A zero are these slower frequencies, and the ones are these parts where the frequency is doubled and it crosses the zero line once in the middle of each period. I just think it's really cool that we can look at an audio file this zoomed in and start to make sense out of it. From that, one important observation is that, in theory, the absolute value of the sound waves doesn't really matter. All the computer cares about are the frequencies and specifically the crossing of the zero line. That's when the hardware detects that the tone has changed. Now, I said in theory because the computer has some hardware in the audio load-in circuit that takes that input and tries to generate a 0 or a 1 from that input value. If the amplitude of the signal is too low, it will never generate a 1, and it won't detect any data. The good news is that we could try to boost the amplitude directly in Audacity, 
and that could solve it. I think the reason that it didn't work for me earlier is that I was being overly naive. So one of the problems is that I selected an audio region randomly. So maybe I did select a pulse halfway through, and then after amplification, I tricked the computer into thinking there was a frequency change when really there was none. To do that in a more accurate way, I should select a segment that starts and ends where the sound crosses the zero line. Fortunately, Audacity has that feature built in, so I can select any region I want and press Z, and Audacity will automatically select the nearest rising zero crossing. Neat! So if I apply the same kind of amplification, will it work now? No, not really. The next problem I'm seeing is that the dip in volume is very uneven. There's a general V-shaped dip, but even within that, there are areas that have very little amplitude and some that have more. So even after we apply an amplification, I suspect that they're still not being registered correctly by the computer. We could just crank up the amplification way up. That means that we'll clip the audio everywhere, but in theory, it's just the zero crossings that matter, right? Yeah, not really. I'm not surprised that that didn't work at all because looking at the circuit, the cassette data is first passed through an RC circuit, then it goes through a two-stage amplifier to generate a more or less binary signal of zero or one, which gets fed to the PPI. Maybe clamping the signals generates some weird discontinuity and it messes up the analog part of this, or maybe the ripples in the signal when they get amplified, they go over a certain threshold and they trigger a transition change, so at least the hardware thinks so, so it's not all that surprising. And speaking of PCBs, I want to thank today's sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay offers very quick turnaround of PCB manufacturing, either for iterating really quickly on your own projects, or maybe even to print a bunch of different boards for a design that you made. The whole upload and submit process couldn't be easier. Just zip up your Gerber files, upload it to the website, indicate a few options like the color of the PCBs that you want, that is very important, along with some other things like your material thickness and a few other parameters, but the default is perfectly fine. Select the kind of shipping that you want and click Submit. In a few days, you'll have a PCB in your hands. Definitely check them out at PCBWay.com next time you need any kind of PCBs made. And now, let's go back to the tape and see if we can make some progress. This is what an ideal sound file looks like for the ti 99 a One thing that stands out to me is how even all the amplitudes are. Even though the actual value doesn't carry any data, that's what the computer ideally expects. To achieve something like this, we can use a limiter amplifier. A limiter allows you to amplify a signal but not go over a certain amount. And we're gonna use a soft limiter, so instead of clipping the signal at that amplitude, it's going to amplify it less as it gets closer to that limit. And when I do this, the signal now looks much more even. This looks a lot more like the ideal signal. So let's try that again. And nothing. It fails in the same spot once again. I think we're in the right track, but I think there's a section somewhere that the signal degraded enough that it just lost the data and we can't read it back. A ti 994 a program file on tape is broken down into sections of 64 bytes called records. Each record has a header of eight zeros followed by one byte of all ones. Then that's followed by these 64 bytes of data and then one byte with a checksum of the data. So far, that's a pretty standard file format and more or less in line with other systems. Those headers, by the way, maybe they're a little excessive to have them every 64 bytes. And by the way, that's why the files sound the way they do. If you listen carefully, you hear a periodic beep, beep, beep among all the other data. Those are the headers that you're hearing. Listen to this. So I thought it was interesting that you can hear the data format. It's also really cool that we can see the header easily when we zoom in. All these low frequency waves are deleting zeros. And these eight higher frequency ones are the ones ending the header. What's much more unusual about the ti 994 file format is that after each of those records, there's another copy of the whole record, including the checksum. So in the normal loading process, it would load the first record, check for the checksum, and if that fails, attempt to load the second record. And if that one fails as well, then it throws up this error. So that sounds like a pretty great idea, but it makes it so it, things take twice as long to load. I guess that wasn't a big deal because basic programs in the ti 994 a are so short that you know, there are only a few Ks. So maybe going from a minute to two minutes is not that big of a deal. And I guess that we're also expecting really bad quality tapes and recording. That's why they added all that redundancy. So what it really means here is that we don't have just one bit that is failing, we have two copies of the same record that are both damaged and they're not matching to the checksum. So the data really must be in even worse shape than I expected. By the way, this device that I'm using here is an SVI CAS, which is an absolutely fantastic 
cassette emulator. So far, I've been using it in raw WAV mode, so it plays WAV files, but it has support from a bunch of different platforms. And what's really cool is that after all the comments and feedback and requests from the last video, the designer of the SVI CAS actually implemented TI-99 support in it. So it makes it right now into an absolutely fantastic device. Okay, let's take a different approach. We may not be able to load it on the computer itself, but maybe we can do that on an emulator. The reason I'm thinking that is because emulators don't usually emulate all the signal processing hardware and instead just try to do an approximation. If we're lucky, our WAV file will be good enough and it will read it correctly. I'm going to use the classic 99 emulator, which seems to be one of the best ones for the TI-99, and it features loading from a WAV file, which is something not a lot of emulators do. Instead, they often just load from tape-specific formats, which is, we'll talk about that later. If I just give it the original recorded file, it fails. But if you noticed, it failed really early. It barely got out of the file header before it printed that message. So that tells me that the loading is probably very different from the computer, which is what I expected. In this case, I learned through trial and error that just having this little bit of noise before the rest of the data is throwing off the emulator. So once we've trimmed the front, okay, then it doesn't throw an error right at the beginning anymore. The problem is that I don't think it's detecting any sound at all because it gets to the end, pauses for a while, and then it gives an error. I tried that with different levels of amplification, but I didn't make any progress with that. Classic 99 is open source, so I went digging through the source code to see what was going on, and right at the start of the tape section, I found this comment. So that doesn't exactly inspire me with confidence. I did a little bit more digging, and it looks like it's just very rudimentary support. It even does some averaging of the levels of the whole file to decide what peak levels are. That probably explains why having that blank section at the beginning was changing things. Anyway, I think we need a different approach. The problem trying to load a program with the real hardware or the emulator is that it's an all or nothing proposition. If we have two bits that are flipped in two copies of the same record, we're done for. Ideally, we want something that reads what it can and maybe exposes a few of the records that have problems. I even mentioned in the previous video that maybe the best way to recover data would be to write a script and analyze the file and reconstruct the data from it. It turns out that as with most things on the internet, that program is already available out there. One of those programs is called Dumplist, and I even got a demo of it last time I talked with Dustin Hubbard about cassette tape restoration. But this program's so powerful. This is that Dumplist that I was talking about, and I dumped that Dragon and Princess tape on the PC-8001 a while back, so I threw it in here. Right here, these little red Xs, that's uh, where it thinks errors are. Unfortunately for our purposes, Dumplist platform support is limited to some platforms popular in Japan, like the PC-8001 family, MSX computers, or FM7. I can pull the waveform in, and like here, let's see, here's where you can see the waveform. Well, there's a bunch of different values kind of right there. You can also reference like the hexadecimal it's giving you sometimes to what it would actually be in the program. You can kind of compare that way. That way, say like you had the print command, and you know, it's P-R-I-N-T. And if in here with the hexadecimal, it's telling you P-L-I-N-T, you know, you had a read error in there. And then you just go in here and tell it, hey, make it an R. That tool isn't available for all platforms, but for the ti 99 we have something somewhat similar. CS1ER, or is it CS1ER? I'm not really sure. That program was designed as a tape converter. It analyzes WAV file recordings, and it can generate TI-99 tape files from it. This program is actually much more sophisticated than the emulator when it comes to processing WAV files, so I'm hopeful this one will be able to read our file. The one thing that drives me crazy about CS1ER is that you can't resize those tiny windows. It is so frustrating, but I think the program is worth it, so let's give it a try. It looks like the original one isn't being picked up correctly. Looking at the waveforms, it's displaying, I think it's just not amplified enough. So let's feed it a more amplified version. Oh, that one is much better. It looks like it mostly read the whole file with just five records that were not read correctly. So right away, this is a big win. We can even display the basic program it interprets so far directly from this program. And you can see that most of the listing is already there. Funnily enough, one of the bytes that is incorrect isn't the title of the program in the comments. So he reads GOG FIGHT instead of DOG FIGHT. Even towards the end of the program, I see other few strings misspelled. So there are quite a few errors already. 
Remember, each record is 64 bytes and five records fail. So maybe that was just a single bit in each record, but maybe that was a lot more. To find out, we can dig even deeper with CS1ER. It actually lets us zoom in into each bad record and examine them. We can see what the WAV file looked like at each point and whether it represented a zero or a one, and we can even toggle them. So in theory, we could manually repair the record this way if we just knew which one corresponded to those text errors. From this, it looks like record 14 appears to have the most bytes wrong. I'm not sure how CS1ER picks the final value. Maybe it does something intelligent, like looking at the waveforms of both values and picking the one that looks more reasonable. One thing we can do, though, is lock some records and change some of the tuning parameters related to how it recognizes the different signals. That can be really helpful to try to narrow things down on stubborn records. Unfortunately, I tried it here a few times, and it didn't help much as far as I could see. But we can use the same technique and try to analyze different recordings of the same program. The idea is that maybe one recording has some bad spots and another recording manages to get those spots correctly and some other spots incorrectly. And between the two of them, we can recover the correct version. So let's go ahead and try that. I'm going to replay the same program, but this time it's going to use a different tape player to maximize our chances of getting different signals. I'll record in Audacity like before. And just for kicks, I'll do it a couple more times with different volume settings. When I load those recordings by themselves in CS1ER, they seem to have more bad records than before, but I noticed that some of the ones that were bad before seem to be reported as okay now. So if I combine the previous recordings with the new ones, oh, wow, now all the records but one are shown okay. Oh, wow. Unfortunately, I tried combining the rest of the recordings, but none of them managed to capture record 14 correctly. So that one seems like it's completely destroyed. Looking at the WAV file, we can visually see each record followed by its copy. Surprisingly, record 14 was not in that big dip in the amplitude where we thought that was the bad problem. But as soon as you zoom in, you can see that record 14 was actually missing a lot of signal in there. I even tried boosting just that section with a limiter, but it didn't improve the processing any. So. I think that data is pretty much gone. The frustrating thing is that if CS1ER offered more of a full vision of that record, both copies, the checksum, and even the basic tokens corresponding to that area, I feel that we could completely restore this just by trying to figure out what the program is doing. But now when we look at the corresponding basic program, we still have Gogfight misspelling at the top, but the strings that earlier were incorrect are now fine. So the program has definitely improved. I'm actually even starting to wonder if Gogfight wasn't a misspelling of the person who typed the program. In any case, I'm not seeing anything obviously wrong with this basic program, so let's save it and see if we can run it. Okay, let's try the fixed program, at least as much as we were able to fix it. So far, no errors. That's really good. Cool. So it loaded. I'm not surprised about that because CS1ER made a correct valid file, so I expected it to load, but that's good. Now let's see what we loaded. I'm gonna do list first. <laughs> we still have a GOG fight, yep. And everything else looks pretty much like what we saw earlier. And yes, this time I learned my lesson and I have the extended basic cartridge installed. Okay, I don't see anything very obviously wrong. Let's see if it runs. There we go, at least it's starting to, to work. Excellent. Day or night, day, okay. I don't know how to control it. <laughs> oh, I'm doing something. Wow, that looks pretty cool. Okay, I mean, this is mostly working. That's pretty amazing. Ha, Noel has won the war. Very cool. CS1ER is actually an amazing program. It looks like it's not under active development and the last version was released over 10 years ago, but it's still incredibly useful. I'm not aware of a program quite like that for other platforms with lots of cassette programs like the ZX Spectrum, Amstrad CPC, or the Commodore 64. If you know of one, let me know in the comments. And if there aren't any, that would make for an awesome open source project if someone is interesting. Just saying. As you can see, recovering data from a damaged tape or any kind of media is far from trivial. Sometimes it takes a lot of effort, deep knowledge of the format, and specialized tools. 
I hope that gave you some good ideas on the challenges we're facing when restoring data from cassette tapes and how to go about it. I still have to recover the data from this floppy disk, but that will have to be in a future video. See you then.